So, uh, Jack, if you don't mind, I want to start because, uh, Carlos, when, when we, we spoke before and we got to, to chat a little and I got to know you a little bit as, as, a, as a storyteller and, and, and a filmmaker, you had just done blind spotting and, um, you know, things were happening for you. How do you go from a film like Blind Spotting, which is, you know, groundbreaking in its own way in terms of storytelling, to being a co-animator on, please tell me the journey to Raya. Um, it was very unexpected. It was um, not something that I, I thought could happen to me at this point in my career. I Like, I grew up watching Disney movies and and... There was always something in the back of my head saying, wouldn't it be cool if one day you got to make one of these? Uh, and that was a feeling that existed in my head. But for some reason, I thought that if that ever were to happen, it would probably be when I was like 50 and I had, had done like plenty of, of uh, other live action movies and then could like dedicate my life to animation. Anyway, I just n never would I have guessed that my second movie to be released in theaters would be a, a major motion picture under Walt Disney Animation. So um, how exactly happened? I mean, there's a direct tie from Blind Spotting, but um, we released it in 2018. We didn't release it. We premiered it in 2018, the, the Sundance Film Festival, which happened to be <clears throat> right around the time when Jennifer Lee, who's the current chief creative officer at Walt Disney Animation Studios, had just started. She had just been promoted to her new role. And part of the, of the very first initiatives that she, um, that she introduced to the studio was that she wanted to open up the, the door for outside directors to join the, mm. the directing team. And, and this is uh, unusual because in the almost 100 years of Disney animation history, there's been uh, one path for directors to, to uh, get their first project with Disney animation. And it's usually either through storyboarding, through animation, or through writing. Um, they, they, these are artists that have been at Disney for a long, long time, and they essentially just get promoted to, to direct their first feature and never have they really opened their doors for for P directors from the other <laughs> to come but wow but, yeah obviously that you know there's there's a a, a reason and like a, a a lot of importance placed into sort of like the the legacy and like what what these people bring with them by having been raised in in sort of like this disney universe but Jen obviously saw saw um, a blind spot there and said look we need to bring in people uh, the, I saw you laughing, Mike. There's, there's yeah, pardon no, the pun. Pardon the pun. No, there's no pun there. Uh, no, but she she said, look, that we need to bring people from the outside. We need to bring directors of color. We need to bring people that are gonna offer fresh perspectives and and you know move our storytelling forward in, in a way that is important. So she invited myself and she invited another director called Susie Unessi to join the the directing department. This was two years ago. And then I was developing my own project. Uh, these stories go through lots of evolution and usually change quite often. These groups morph and grow sometimes because these movies are massive. So about a year and a half ago, myself, Don Hall, and Kui Gwen, who's one of our, our writers, joined the, the Raya team. And then from then to now, we've been working on that nonstop well, I'm, I'm just curious now, um, because of animation and, and you know, you know, the three of you, a year and a half, I, I don't know how far along it was, but that's not a very long time uh, to get something done. So did, did the pandemic in any way just keep you guys more focused during this time? Uh, no, I mean, these movies uh, take a long, long time from, from development to completion. It's somewhere between four and six years. And this particular one, was on on the on the longer end of that so it took almost six years to finish this movie obviously wow. I, I joined I joined like way way late in that timeline uh, mm -hmm. but prior to that there had been a big team of artists uh, storyboard uh, people um, our producing team they had been on this journey for almost four and a half years 
Um, so we joined about a year and a half ago. We were starting most of the time previous to us joining had been spent in development. So a lot of research trips, a lot of consultants coming in, creating the story, writing the first few drafts of the screenplay, starting to do a lot of the, of the visual design and creating the world. Uh, but production didn't really start until uh, about this time, like maybe January of last year. So that meant that we had just started. We had, I think, two sequences in production, only a few shots animated when we all had to go home. Uh, and as you can imagine, it just completely uh, wrecked all the plans for the movie. We had to like, reimagine the process. Uh, the people in technology had to figure out how to all of a sudden um, allow us to continue working from over 450 different homes. Uh, so they had to send everyone with computers, figure out uh, some kind of like uh, system so that people could upload stuff from the the sort of like the the heart of the production, which was still in Burbank, but only I think like a group of like 10 people was working there. And then everyone else was working from home. So it, 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 they just had to reinvent how Disney Animation makes movies uh, to, wow. to adapt to this pandemic in. Honestly, I we, we don't think that it suffered too much. I think uh, the the release date of the movie changed by three months, which is nothing. And honestly, everyone was able to work from their individual homes, which uh, was unprecedented. What's also special to note is that this is the first movie coming out in theaters when New York City has allowed the doors to reopen at 25% capacity. So now all of a sudden, pieces are moving uh, at Warner uh, at Disney. They're, they're, they're now, all the business executives are like, okay, we got to look at these metrics. But not only that metric, there's also the metric of the fact that this is an Asian film, the fact that you're a Latino director, uh, the fact that you have the burden of, I guess, succeeding to see if these movies work in theaters now, along with them being on Premiere Access and Disney Plus afterwards. How are you wrapping your head around the, 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 the importance and the significance of what this movie represents for Hollywood at this very minute and how you're right at the center of it? You asked a, a very big question with a lot of components. So let me try to unpack it and then remind me if I'm leaving. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that these times are unprecedented and no one really knows what's going to happen. Uh, I, you know, when this was first starting, I remember we were reaching out to sort of like the executives at Disney Animation or Disney just being like, please give us some insight. Like, what can we expect? Do you know something that we don't know? And the, the answer that came often was just like, look, we know as much as you do. We're learning every day and it's impossible. I can't give you... Uh, a, a, any kind of prediction for what's going to happen in the next uh, day, week, month. It's its impossible to predict. So really, we're just kind of improvising together. And I think that's still, you know, we have a little bit more certainty now that there's vaccine, now that we, it, it's different than, than last summer when, when we were first starting to figure out what, what was going to happen here. Um, what, we're, what we're excited about is the fact that the movie feels really timely it feels like it 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 presents themes that to me feel very necessary and we're very excited that people are going to get a chance to experience the movie regardless of their situation if they're in a location where theaters are open and they feel comfortable going into a theater in a safe manner then they'll be able to have that experience which is obviously a a, a very unique experience to see these kinds of movies on a big screen with a great sound system but if that is not a possibility, then uh, rather than just not seeing the movie at all, they we have the advantage of having this platform where they're able to see it at home, they're able to see it with their family, they're able to see it multiple times and share it with other people. So we like to think that it's uh, the best case scenario for now. Uh, and yeah, I mean, theaters keep opening. I think I, I just read that um, some some counties in California are also going into uh, reopening stages, and many of those include um, very limited capacity movie theaters, but uh, apparently in San Francisco and other counties, they're, they're going to be able to start opening theaters. So uh, hopefully enough people get a chance to 
see that experience because it's 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 very uh, it's a special one. It's a litmus test is uh, what this movie is going to mean for a lot of the executives over at Disney. One of the criticisms we've been talking about in the show has been how In the Heights hired an Asian director to do a Latino movie. Mm -hmm. In a moment where we're, we're like image representation, you know, we need people in positions of power. We got to give our own people the chance to do our own movies, to tell our stories the way they should be told, the purity of it. This, but, this is the, the reverse example of that. Right. So now we got a Latino and an Asian movie, right, uh, as director. And I think the question, because everybody's so focused right now on race, almost in every aspect of entertainment as we speak, how is it, how are you dealing with the fact that you, as a Latino, you're telling this Asian story? Now, again, there's a lot of commonalities in there, but educate me. Should a director that is foreign to the native storyline, should they be directing these movies? Or should, if it's an Asian movie, it should be an Asian director. If it's a Latino, it should be a Latino. Should that, is that the way it should be? I mean, I think you ask a lot of good questions. I think that absolutes are are usually problematic. And I think that, you know, throwing down the gauntlet and saying like, no one who isn't, Latino should never ever be able to tell a Latino story or no one who doesn't belong to the race should never be able to tell that story. Like I, I wouldn't support that philosophy because I, I do feel that film allows you to do that, allows you to, to live in bodies and experience stories that are foreign to your own. And that's the way that we generate empathy and that's the way we grow. I also I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that there is a problem of representation in, in film uh, and that until that problem doesn't exist, the only way to solve it is by really pushing for for people who have some direct, profound connection to the material to be the ones telling the story. So I, I, I don't necessarily think that any any one perspective is wrong. Uh, I I will say that I had the same question when I started working on Blind Spotting. I remember mm. David, David and Rafa invited me to direct the movie, and I told them, look. I love and respect both of you. I want to make this movie because I know that it's going to be worth my time. But are you sure that you don't want a black filmmaker from Oakland directing this movie? So you uh, even brought it up. <laughs> I, well, I, it just it just it's it's a movie that deals with race is a movie that deals with questions of identity. And it does so in such a specific way. Uh, that was just my first question. Like, wouldn't you want someone who understands Oakland from the inside? Wouldn't you want someone who's blank, black and can speak to the black experience in a way that for obvious reasons I can't? Uh, and they, without hesitating, they said, no, you like, we believe in you as a filmmaker. We think that you're going to be able to uh, understand our hometown and what we love about it. And like, we're going to be here for you to, uh, as resources for you to like understand as much as you need to, but you know, it, it, we, we want you to tell our story. And that was very empowering. Like the, the trust that they, they gave me and then the fact that they believed, you know, they are very specific when it comes to issues of, of representation and the fact that they thought that I, I was the right person uh, really just gave me all the confidence that I needed to do it. And I feel similarly here, it's, it's like, uh, Yes, obviously, if we could design all these experiences to be uh, perfect and flawless, there, there, th that should be should be happening. But uh, I think that the 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 closest that we can get is by having people who are really open and and humble to 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 um, go into these experiences, knowing that they're going to need to rely on people who do have those direct connections surrounding themselves with uh, at least one, but ideally a group of people who can help you build these stories and characters from the inside that you're not just approaching on a surface level and that you're engaging with the community, that you're treating it with a lot of responsibility and that you understand that, that you are aware that you're an outsider being welcomed into this culture. And just like, you know, when you're a guest at someone's home, like you come in with a set of expectations and you say, I, I, I'm going to play by your rules. I'm going to uh, observe and document what I see rather than to try to uh, uh, give you directives or give you my point of view. Like this is about me amplifying your point of view more or 
entirely as opposed to me like coming in and giving you mine like my my point of view is just to capture yours right now uh so i i think that as long as people who are telling stories that are are uh not their own culturally socially the racially I, I feel like as long as there is that dialogue and as long as there's that kind of relationship that kind of dynamic and both people on both sides are are, are welcoming that experience i i think that there's there's you know these kinds of stories should be celebrated and people being able to immerse themselves into someone else's culture culture is really a, a beautiful thing uh, i've grown a lot from it and i i would love for someone who is not mexican to tell a story that takes place in mexico and treat it with so much responsibility as i i would tell someone else's uh cultural story and if someone really went uh, to Mexico and got to meet the people and got to experience and got to do the research and like really saw it from the inside. Like, I think that is a beautiful thing, but there, there's a lot of steps that I think need to happen in order for that, to, for this to be like a, a productive process and, and not one of, you know, appropriation. I can see why David and, and Rafael, why, why they were like, yeah, no, you're the guy. Yeah. Uh, so true. I'm curious though, for you now as uh, couple things that you said and to build on what Jack was saying because a large part of our show is about unity and you know even blind spotting you know it's about unity you know it's a Latino guy directing a white guy and a black guy uh, and you know you are a co-director on this project so that you know it's all about working cooperating and everybody brings something so what what do you feel you brought to this project and and what attracted you to it what made you say, you know what, it's not just that it's animated, but I love this story or what it what it has to say. Uh, I well, there's the first is sort of like the culture of Disney animation, and then I'll I'll tell you a little bit specifically about uh, this movie in particular. But the culture of Disney animation, the way they construct their stories, is very different from anything I've ever done or heard before, and it, it's truly collaborative and it's truly a creative community coming together to build a story uh, and I think on the on the surface it may sound as if it's movie making by committee or if it's like you know corporate filmmaking uh, and yes it is a corporation but it's it's um, it's a lot more profound than that and the way that that we collaborate with the artists that are working on this film with the other director and the co-directors and we have two writers you know it, it's quite a, 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 a it's a number of people that are that are helping construct this and the only way that these collaborations are are successful because they could very easily uh, go south. They could very easily turn contentious. They could very easily, as soon as ego egos get in the way, it, it could just become a mess. But here, you really have to learn to to uh, coexist with other creative minds. You really have to learn to take ideas in, to not say no, uh, to learn how to collaborate, to learn how to not shut shut other people down to build on each other, uh, to, to communicate effectively. Like it's, it's a lot of really complicated interpersonal skills that need to come at play for, for these collaborations to work uh, 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 properly. And that was very exciting to me. I had just worked on a movie, it hasn't been released. Uh, it comes out in, in theaters this summer. It's called Summertime. And I had just done it before um, joining Disney Animation, and this was this was a, a project, a narrative film project that we we uh, constructed with a group, a small community of spoken word artists, uh, ages like seventeen to twenty five. There was there was like twenty or so of them, and then we all worked on the story together. And it's one of the most rewarding experience, creative experiences of my life, because similarly to this, we this was rather than coming in and dictating what you want your vision to be and then making everyone around you sort of like adhere to it and, and help you um, accomplish that, this is, this is the opposite. This is coming in with uh, vulnerability and, and openness of saying, look, I believe that what this group has to offer is more than I do. 
as an individual. So let's work together and let's see how our brains can can uh, support each other in doing something that we believe is worth it. So anyway, I had just had such a beautiful experience doing that. Uh, and this really just felt very similar to that experience, but on a whole other level, like all of a sudden you're collaborating with 450 different artists. Uh, <laughs> our, we had like 10 story artists, which are working with us every day. We had like probably like 15 visual development artists. And then you start bringing in the animators. We had a hundred animators on the show at some point. Uh, so it, it really just becomes uh, almost like a social experiment of how you can have all of this creative input and all these people, how can you inspire them to work towards a similar goal, knowing that things are gonna change, knowing that ideas are going to evolve and knowing that egos, like this is not about egos and this is not about someone proving that they have a strong vision. This is about someone proving that they can be open and willing to work with others. Uh, so that was really exciting to me. And then uh, ironically enough, the, the theme of the movie is the same is about uh, unity, through trust and how people with different worldviews, uh, different ideologies that are, are opposing, uh, how they can coexist, work together, trust each other again. So uh, I feel like for both of those reasons, this project just felt so exciting. And I, I've learned so much in the last two years. I've grown as an artist, I've grown as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, uh, and, and you know, who. Again, had you asked me three years ago, uh, is Disney the place for you to to uh, evolve as a filmmaker? <laughs> I, I just it wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to give you that answer. But I'm just so happy to be here with this group of people. It's been a, a really great ride. Carlos, when people get into the process of filmmaking, into the business of filmmaking, the first thing that they pick up is Creativity Inc. Uh, to understand the true nature of storytelling, and Disney's considered probably the main institution, the holy grail of storytelling. What did you learn about storytelling in this process? Well, uh, that, I, let me see if I can answer that question because I feel like there's there's been uh, so many things. I, I've i just never constructed, like I've directed a lot of projects. I got to work with David and Rafa, but I've never constructed a movie from nothing. And I've never had to sort of like create characters and worlds and scenarios and, and, and moments that... Um, are going to be, are going to affect people across the world of different ages. Cause really the reach that, that a Disney movie has is unlike anything. Uh, just the fact that there's people who uh, are young enough to not be able to speak, read, write and are watching these movies and there's people my age. And then there's also my mom and my grandma are, are you know excited about these movies. It's it's I think that sometimes it's easy to get cynical about it, but it's it's a really profound reach that these movies have and learning to tell stories with such simplicity and with such clarity that um, you're able to reach all of those audiences that you're able to you're able to communicate something that is as basic as something that you know the youngest person in your family can grasp but also something that is as complex and as layered uh, that that you know my YouTube would would uh, be engaged by and attracted by and you know hopefully be thought provoking in some way it's it's a real art form and not to say that I, I have the formula and not to say that I, I know how to do it, but I, I think that the last year and a half in constructing the story has really sort of like made me have to exercise some muscles in my brain that I don't think anything else would have. Yeah. Carlos, uh, I think we have seconds left here, but I wanted to uh, ask you this really quick. Blue Beetle from Warner Brothers, the first Latino superhero is finally gonna be coming to the big screen. What do you think the impact is for us today as Latinos to see finally the first ever Latino superhero from a major studio coming to a screen near you? I'm just happy that we're, we're a part of this era now that is putting so much effort on accurate representation and is putting so much effort in making sure that the stories that we tell come from place of truth and you know a place of power i'm excited to see it i am excited to see it i'm excited to i'm sure it's not the only one so i'm excited to see all this wave of new films that come from from uh, this this era